Let's take a look at the language with the five senses method. What is language with the five senses? Well, language with the five senses is a zero translation, comprehensible input method that facilitates language acquisition the way our brains are naturally wired. In the last lesson, we learned about how our brains learn new information, how we retain that information in the brain, and how we retain it long term. We learned that all skills, all new skills, and all learning is a sensory experience. We learned that language is instinctual. However, acquiring language is exactly the same. It's learned and it's a sensory experience. We learned how our sensory receptors send messages to the brain based on input they receive. So this method uses those sensory receptors in order to send new language input to the brain. So let's talk about comprehensible input. What is comprehensible input? Comprehensible input is not new. It's been around for a really long time. And those of you who are doing this training, who are certified language teachers, know about comprehensible input already. I guarantee it. Comprehensible input is language input that can be understood by listeners, despite them not understanding all of the words and structures. It uses contextual supports to help students understand. Did you know that we only actually hear 15 to 25% of the words being spoken to us in our native language? We talked about using translation last in the last lesson and how that creates a block to fluency. Well, that is because translation makes a student or a learner or a person focus on every single word rather than the whole of what's being communicated. Comprehensible input focuses on specific language and not, the, not understanding every single word. You can understand what's being communicated to you. Language with the five senses focuses on fluency and human connection. It's been proven over and over and over again that translation is counterproductive to fluency. Now I have a little bit of a controversial viewpoint here because there are many, many comprehensible input methods out there or comprehensible input experts that swear by translation. In fact, I got into a heated discussion with one a couple of years ago because he said it's more important for students to understand right away rather than having to let their brains work for it. And I countered with studies show that's just not true. Your brain has to work for it. Your brain has to process it. And it's okay if they don't understand right away. Translation is instant gratification. It does not promote fluency, even in a comprehensible input method. And again, my viewpoint is controversial, but I'm strong in it because I've done the research, I, I've, I've studied the science. Your brain will default to what is known. Your brain will default to what is easier. And in fact, when you're presented with two different languages and you're told a word and then put the, the word is put into your native language, your brain will ignore the new word and default to the one that you know. Your brain will not hear words coming in if it can read a familiar word. The exception to this 
is for a young child who is learning two languages simultaneously. That's different because that's not translation. That's a child learning new information at the same time. And actually, I get a lot of questions. Oh, Elizabeth, is it bad for students to be learning multiple languages at once? And my answer is no, absolutely not. It's actually fantastic for the brain. And eventually, when that happens, the brain will work it out. But when you are a strong speaker of one language and you are learning a new language, it is best to not mix them up because that will get you stuck. Your brain will default to what is familiar. And the science proves it. The language center of your brain is the only part of the brain that actually closes and language is solidified by the age of about 12 years old. That's why we have accents. We say um, babies are polyglots. I talk about this a lot. Babies are polyglots. They have the ability to speak any language in the world, but by the time a child becomes about between eight and 12 years old, they lose that ability the older they get. But if you use your senses and tap in to your other senses, you have the possibility to reopen some of those language receptors. Some of those dendrites can regrow, or you can grow dendrites in other parts of the brain that can connect to those dendrites that are solidified in your language center. The younger you are, the easier it is to do this. This method focuses on whole language, communication, global understanding, not accuracy. We are a strong CI method and we use a lot of comprehensible input without translation. Translation can actually break those language connections, making a student rely on their L1, their first language. This method help students actually think in the target language, and it makes it easier to produce spontaneous language later. And I say later because we focus on receptive language in the first two years. Let those, it is really, really important. Translation breaks those language connections. As I said, your brain will default to what is familiar and ignore what is new. Unless you force your brain to do the work. It is okay to let the brain do the work. And it's okay to let your students' brains, your children's brains, do the work. That is what has to happen in order to effectively acquire and retain any skill, but especially language in the brain. I use the L1, or English, first language, to explain rules. So, I don't teach a lot of grammar in the first two years, but as we progress and we get more and more into those, uh, the upper levels of study where students are learning to read, or, or sorry, learning to write, learning to speak, we do need to focus on grammar a little bit more heavily. And so, I do use English in order to explain a grammar rule. However, a lot of people ask me about, well, what about the upper levels? We focus so heavily on this in the first two years of language learning because students need to have a solid foundation of just chunking, which we're going to talk about, scaffolding. They need to have that solid foundation in order to later delve into the rules. So they need to have an understanding that this is the structure before they can go into this is why this is the structure. And in the early years, a lot of times 
a student, I might ask a question and a student might respond to me in English. That tells me they understood. And that, at that point, it's super important. And then I might repeat back to them their answer in the target language so that they can hear what they they can hear what the answer would have been in the language back to them i also like i said i do word associations in the last lesson i talked about word associations and interpretation retell all of those things because a lot of times especially in the united states we don't start early enough so a lot of times you've got your you know english speaking brain up here that can understand and read and uh, and analyze and all of that up here and then you have your baby l2 brain over here and i always tell my students you are french babies you are babies you cannot think and when i take my students on immersion and they're with all the European students that have been studying French since they were, you know, two. They, I always tell my students, you cannot compare yourselves to students who have been studying for 10 years longer than you have. You are a baby. You're a French baby. It takes a long time. It takes longer than four years in order to even speak fluently. So. We have more success with a method like this than we do with the typical translation methods that maybe some of us grew up with. Oh man, I remember learning German in high school and oh, I, I, I barely retained any of it. The only thing that I retained from my German study is the summer I spent in Germany. I remember all the language from that. All right, so let's define fluency. I define fluency as it's split into two. So we have fluency in general is the speed and fluidity at which our brains can process and produce language. Currently, I am speaking to you with fluency, okay? It has nothing to do with being accurate. It has nothing to do with being accurate. Think about how many native English speaking Americans there are that are not accurate or who, that do not speak with correct grammar. Okay. So this is fluency. It's speaking with um, uh, uh, cadence and uh, uh, fluidly and a, a certain pace. Okay. And then I further divide fluency into two categories. We have receptive fluency how much we can understand and how quickly our brain can process receptive language. Now, receptive language is this, listening and reading. So our receptive, uh, our two receptive sensory, sensory receptors are your eyes and your ears, okay? What you can read and what you can hear and what you can understand and what you can listen to. Expressive fluency is how rapidly our brain can process and produce a language spontaneously or in response to receptive language. So for example, in the early years, I will talk about chunking and scaffolding later in the training, but in the early years, I give students the tools the exact language that I want them to practice when we are working on our whatever we're working on, whatever concept we're working on, I give them the exact tools I want them to use. And we solidify those in the brain and we give them to them for recall. You know, I want them to know, for example, how to go in and order their baguette like that in the boulangerie. And so we do a lot of jazz chants and rhythms and things like that so that they have recall so that they can effectively use the language when they are in a situation where they need it. Expressive fluency doesn't come till much later. Expressive fluency is formulating words in the brain in response to something that you have been uh, some some kind of outside stimuli. So for example, a conversation, being asked a question, um, 
being able to write an essay, that's all expressive. Now, Stephen Krashen, who is incredible, he has uh, a YouTube uh, video cast. I don't know if you can call it a podcast because I think a podcast is when you're just on uh, you don't have a video. So he has a YouTube channel. And the other day he was saying that students should not be actually reading, like actually reading for two semesters, for at least two semesters. That's the whole first year. So I teach students words way later. I don't show students words until way later, and it depends on their age too, okay? So we'll talk about that and actually showing them the words, but there is a process, and we're gonna talk about the process, and there is a process before you show students words. And we also, when we talk about vocabulary, we'll talk about showing having students uh, learn vocabulary in a context rather than by itself. So, the process that we use with language with the five senses mimics how we learn our first language. It is the exact same process in the brain as we learn our first language. So, how did you learn your first language? How did you learn your first language? Well, I learned mine by listening, which is how we all learn our first language. So our first communication is crying. And you know, if you're a mother, you know the differences in your baby's cries, right? You know a baby's hungry cry, you know a baby's I'm mad cry, I don't wanna be here, I needed my diaper change cry, I'm tired and fighting sleep cry. There are other ways of communicating besides just speaking. And so we have an early instinctual way of communicating our needs to those who are caring for us. But human connection is rooted in language because human connection is rooted in the fact that we need to be able to communicate our needs to those who are caring for us when we are babies so we can survive. And that's what makes language an essential part of the human experience, this need to communicate. But humans aren't the only ones who communicate. Animals communicate with each other as well. We spend at least two to three years just listening. You don't come out of and you're born and you say, hi, mom, hi, dad, I'm here, here I am. You listen, you imitate sounds, you repeat words, you babble. We need at least, when we're young, up to 12 years old, 300 hours of just listening to create a foundation of receptive language in the brain. Once you're up above 12 years old, it jumps to 15 hours of just listening. Now think about it. How can our students that are starting in high school or eighth grade, starting at the age of 14, how are they able to get that? When we are teaching one hour a day, five days a week in the typical classroom, one hour a day, five days a week, and we stay in the target language, one hour a day, five days a week, 100% of the time, that's only 120 hours in a year. And that's if we're doing it every day. Now take out time for assemblies, take out time for holidays, take out weekends. That's a that's not a lot of time. So to expect a student to be fluent in a language in four years of studying, or even after two years of studying, 
It's unrealistic and unreasonable. We can, however, use the senses and comprehensible input in order to give students as much of that listening as possible. Expressive language is produced slowly. So even after that time, you don't, you know, young children, babies, toddlers, they don't come out making full sentences. They start with one word, two words, three words, okay? And they do a lot of imitating. Okay, and they hear a lot of songs and stories and rhythms and all of that. A lot of times uh, adults or teenagers, they think, oh, well, I'm too old to learn that way. Or this is kind of not, you know, oh, I'm, you know, this is uncomfortable. But it doesn't matter how old you are because when you're learning a new language, you're a baby again and you have to do the same thing. And it is uncomfortable. But sometimes we have to do things that are uncomfortable in order to achieve, in order for our students to achieve. Because I've had teachers say, this is uncomfortable for me. For me, it's not. I sing everything. My kids know, my students know I sing everything. We spend approximately 55% of our lives listening. And we only actually hear 17 to 25% of the words being spoken, and that's in our native language. So this is the process in the language with the five senses method. And we always follow this process. So the first step, I listen. I listen. Students simply listen to language. They're not asked to do anything else but listen. And there's no English. No English subtitles, no English written words, no English because they are wanting, you want them to listen to language, they will default to whatever's familiar and they will stop listening. That's the way the brain works. They're not asked to produce, only listen. So you can do this, and we're, we're going to talk about specific techniques throughout the rest of the training. But this can be done through reading short stories, bits of text that use vocabulary, songs. It can be used uh, through, um, you know, putting vocabulary to rhythm, all sorts, just listening. Then I move my body. Students are still listening, but now they are asked to sing the specific vocabulary or grammar, put it together with body movements, gestures, sing the words, with moving the body, help create connections in the brain. So singing, chanting, body movement, it does two things. When it's put to rhythm or music, it goes directly into the long-term memory. And it's solidified because it's making kinesthetic connections. So if I'm singing, I, I sing everything, but I might do something called a clap snap. Uh, let's do the days of the week. Lundi, mardi, mercredi, jeudi, vendredi, samedi, et dimanche. Lundi, mardi, mercredi, je, jeudi, samedi, et dimanche, okay? And that helps create that kinesthetic piece, that touch. It also creates better pronunciation because we hear language that is rhythmic in a different way than we hear spoken language. And this is true in our native language as well. I draw. So the next step is we draw pictures of the vocabulary. We draw pictures of the sentences. We draw pictures um, of, to associate words with images instead of words with words. So I, when I'm drawing with my student, I draw along with the students. I describe what I'm drawing. I'm loading the student with receptive language. They're drawing, creating that kinesthetic piece as well. Next, we play with the language. We play through very 
carefully crafted language games where they're practicing the language, solidifying the information that goes directly into the long-term memory. Then I create. Students apply the language in project-based assessments that ask them to apply the skills. I don't ever test my students and like the language with the five senses method is a 100% performance based assessment method. We don't ever test in language with the five senses method. Now I realize that this might be hard for some who are in schools or school districts that require tests, but I encourage you to eliminate tests as much as possible because when we give the students a real application of the language they are going to retain it more i guarantee you than if they are tested because they they're, they're actually using the skills and then lastly i cook students cook and learn about food from the cultures that speak the language and through all this we're also adding other cultural aspects other global citizenship uh, aspects and there is a huge a, a huge part of language with the five senses is that global citizenship education piece. Now, as you can see, nowhere in here did I put I read or I write. Reading and writing comes with the I draw. I do show them the words at the I draw stage, but in the first two years, all of those are oral mostly and we do very little writing it's not till we get to the third year of study that we really switch and focus more on those expressive competencies however i will say that there is a huge piece of this method that is focused on literacy and i will talk about specifically literacy and reading in a future lesson. And there you have it. That's an overview of the language with the five senses method. The next lesson we'll be talking about teaching vocabulary and teaching grammar as vocabulary.